All right. Well, good morning, everyone. I am Tony Giles. I'm the general manager here at CJPRMA. And a lot of you probably know about CJPRMA. Some of you are probably just attending because someone uh, shared that we were having this training. But we are an excess liability pool that provides uh, a variety of insurance coverages to your agencies who are members with us. Uh, one of the coverages we carry is a cyber liability policy. And obviously cybersecurity is one of the big issues out there and one of the big risks that cities are facing these days. So I'm very happy to have with us today, Don Hester, uh, who is uh, very skilled in cybersecurity issues. Uh, I've known Don from before the time he was at City of Livermore, but Don is currently the cybersecurity manager at City of Livermore, who is one of our members. So it's Great to have him as part of the CJPRMA family. Uh, with today's training, I uh, just ask that all of you uh, look and make sure that you uh, uh, are on mute uh, so that uh, Don's not interrupted. And then during the course of the training, if you have any questions, uh, please shoot them into the chat and I'll be keeping an eye out and I can let Don know that you had a question. Or... If you feel like there's a nice little pause in Don's presentation, uh, unmute yourself and you can ask the question too. But both ways will work for us. And with that, I will hand it off to Don. Thank you, Tony. I really appreciate it. And welcome everybody. Um, if you have attended uh, these sessions in the past, um, this isn't the first time I've presented for CJA PMRA. Um, this is actually, I don't know, I have to ask Tony, I think it's four or five times. So uh, usually once a year or so, uh, we go through this kind of stuff. What I like to start off with, uh, first off, is just kind of like going over what our current trends are as far as what's going on. Uh, and then I'm going to get into um, a portion of IT governance. I did a longer class, I think, for CJPMA. Um, in 2019, that was like a almost like a six hour class that talked about governance of information and technology. Uh, we're not going to do obviously six hours today. One of the things we just barely scratched on is uh, executive management and um, uh, elected officials. How are they involved in cybersecurity? How should they be involved in cybersecurity? And so there's guidance out there for that. The question is like, um, how are we as local governments going to uh, bring that information to those uh, decision makers. Uh, so starting off with uh, current trends, I usually like to start off with something that's kind of funny. You know, I, I like this cartoon I saw it the other day and I said, this is a good way to start off, you know, because it is a very serious subject that we're always talking about. But uh, I like this one because he's like, hey, your password's too weak. And he throws it out and says, who's weak now? Um, but uh, it uh, gives you an idea that we do have a sense of humor even when we're talking about cybersecurity, but it still is a really important thing. Uh, another thing that I came across that I thought was kind of really interesting was talking about some of the myths of cybersecurity. And I found that uh, most of these uh, I come across on a regular basis where somebody says something about uh, cybersecurity. Isn't that just an IT issue, right? And that's the first myth. It's not an IT issue. Uh, IT certainly is involved, but it's really a, a business issue. And when I say business, really what I mean is it's an operational issue, right? It's an enterprise risk. It's not a IT risk. Um, uh, small businesses don't need to worry about it. So we have a lot of small local governments and a lot of them say, well, we're too small. The problem is the smaller you are, the less likely you are to be resilient through an attack. Right, so the impact would be greater for a small organization versus a larger organization. Um, so it still becomes, it's, it's still an enterprise risk that you have, it still needs to be addressed. Uh, some people say that cybersecurity is too expensive. Uh, it's expensive not to, <laughs> let's just go that way. It's a much more expensive not to. Uh, you, what do they say? That old adage, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, and that certainly is true with cybersecurity. Uh, there's some really good things that you could do if you're a small organization. You can send me an email afterwards, um, and I can give you that information. Uh, the top three things that you could do to really reduce risk uh, that aren't expensive, uh, but they do take a little bit of uh, management. Um, cybersecurity is only responsibility of the IT department. Actually, it's not the responsibility of IT department interestingly enough, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, and cybersecurity is too complex. Actually, it's not complex. It's just 
I don't know, maybe the right people aren't hearing the message and what needs to be done. Um, there, it, certainly IT is complex uh, and certainly some of the cybersecurity things that we need to implement are complex, uh, but a lot of basic stuff is still not getting done, right? And so uh, we'll talk about some of those things. Um, this was an interesting slide. This just came out uh, from the 2022 Cyber Defense Report. Really interesting is that almost more than half of organizations have been hit between one and 10 times, right? Um, so in other words, this is what we would consider an actual breach. Somebody has actually broken into a system. Um, they've compromised it in some way, shape or form. Uh, they could take it down is one way of doing it. They could breach it and take the information out of it. That's another way. Uh, but when you count all those up, uh, almost all organizations are getting at least one to five times. Uh, and then we have a bunch that are getting more than 10 times. And then you have only 14% of organizations report that they haven't had a breach um, that they know of, right? So uh, recently there was a report that came out and I couldn't find it, but uh, hackers had been in a system for upwards near 10 years before uh, anyone even found out that they were in the system. So the not once is, of course, I don't think it's 14.7, it's gonna be less than that because there's a lot of people that don't know that they've been compromised and someone's inside their organization just hiding. So um, with that, that tells you that our organizations are definitely susceptible to being attacked within the next 12 months, obviously. There's a high likelihood of that. Um, so for local governments, what's the situation? What is the spending on you know, IT? I often get this asked this question, like how much are we spending on IT? Uh, according to GFOA, it's about 2% of IT budgets for ICMA. They said it ranged anywhere from 0% to 10%. Uh, we asked um, the National Association of State CISOs, and they said it was closer to 3% uh, for the state level. Um, in private industry, the average is about 15 to 20 percent of the IT budget. Now, when you actually go talk to the finance folks and say, hey, how much of the budget are we actually spending on IT? It's going to be a little bit sometimes difficult to actually come up with those numbers. So while these things are interesting facts to look at, I don't know what you do with that. Uh, for one, you know, when I put into our budget, uh, the firewall, we put it under cybersecurity because it's a defensive mechanism. Um, in other organizations, they put it under infrastructure. So when we say 2%, what are we really saying? I mean, we'd have to have some kind of reporting guidance on cybersecurity for any of these numbers to make sense. The second one is that uh, a Gartner report actually came out and said, hey, the whole idea is not how much you spend, it's do you mitigate risk to an acceptable level? Right. So we know that we could get hit. We know that we could get uh, a big impact. Um, are you spending enough to do it? And the question is, and don't compare yourself with your peer because your peer may be different. Right. Uh, not every city is the same. Uh, our city has wastewater treatment. Another city may not. And in that case, we're going to spend a little bit more on cybersecurity because we have operational technology we also need to protect. So those are the things to kind of look at. Um, but there is a clear signal across all of them and that we're not spending enough or we're not spending it in the right places because we continue uh, to be hit. Some of these other things we'll talk about in uh, a couple next slides coming up. Uh, of course, we got to talk about insurance, right? Uh, so uh, the, the funny thing about cyber uh, security insurance that we've noticed le recently is that it's kind of in its infancy. In other words, when you first were able to get it, uh, Tony and I were talking about this the other day, it was kind of a novelty, you know, it wasn't something that, you know, insurance companies were expecting to have large payouts for. Uh, you used to be able to get it for dirt cheap and it was kind of underpriced, uh, but now it's bursting, right? You know, a lot of companies have taken a lot of losses because of that. And so we're seeing the price of uh, cyber insurance get up and becoming more, uh, appropriate for the level of risk that we're really talking about. Um, so yes, everybody's complaining that it's going up and it is going up, but it's probably correcting itself to become more in line with what's reasonable. Um, that being said, you know, there's a lot of folks out there saying, hey, you know, it's going to get really expensive. And if you don't have proper minimal level of cyber hygiene, 
um, it's going to end up costing you more. Um, so you're looking at your prices possibly doubling, but also not being able to renew it, right? So a lot of organizations are going to say, hey, uh, if you don't have multi-factor authentication turned on, we won't insure you. So it's going to limit your possibilities for insurance, right? So uh, some of the things that they're looking for, uh, you're going to want to kind of look into it. And there's been plenty of different things. The Global Insurance Market Index also was talking about, you know, it rose by 96% in the United States, and they're expecting 204 uh, year over year increase um, because it was underpriced, right? So it's not, not unheard of that this needs to happen. So uh, the takeaway here, insurance is going to cost us more um, if we should have expected that. Um, and it's a great way to kind of mitigate some of the impact of cyber incidents, but not the only thing that we can use, right? Um, talking about cyber incidents, in the last year, there's been a couple of different laws that have uh, been enacted. Um, and you're starting to see now states requiring local governments um, and even uh, uh, certain types of breaches to be reported to them. And you have the federal government also looking to do that. Uh, in fact, uh, on March 15th of this year, Joe Biden signed into law uh, the Strengthening American Cybersecurity Act, which is going to, it gives the CISA 24 months to come up with how and what they want to be reported, especially for critical infrastructure. Uh, as of like, I think yesterday, the CISA came out and said that they were going to ask for more than 24 months um, because they didn't want to rush it. They want to make sure they get the right things in place. But it's coming where we are going to have to report to the federal government if we've had a breach. Now, the question is, what kind of breach at what level do we need to report? That's what the CISA is asking for more time to kind of work through. But if we're in critical infrastructure, which as local governments, we pretty much are. I mean, I highlighted them here. Any government facilities, critical infrastructure, transportation, if you're a transportation agency or have transportation, water, wastewater, energy, uh, emergency services, dams, all of these things are you know, part of local governments. And so we're a part of critical infrastructure and therefore we fall under certain guidelines that we just talked about uh, as far as reporting in the near future probably not in the next two years, uh, but it is something right now you can report it and is voluntary and they highly recommend that you do. And I recommend that you do too. Uh, the CISA Department of Homeland Security is not going to take the information and tell everybody, hey, look how bad that city is. But they actually take that information and use it to determine where the biggest needs are. Like if they found out that the reason why your system was compromised because you had an aging operating system that is out of date, they would then put out a bulletin, not naming you, but just saying, hey, you know, there's been a number of breaches and we've found these four things um, that are common to those breaches and we need you to fix those things as soon as possible. Uh, and they actually do release those reports on a regular basis currently. Uh, this, what's coming is that you're gonna be mandated to do it, right? So th that's the difference. And, Ransomware, uh, what can we say about that? Well, it's growing, right? So if we look at the statistics, uh, 2018, 170 local governments got hit. In 2019, it rose to 966. And then 2022, it went to 2,354. And last year was 2,323. It went down a little bit, yay, but it's really, it's really kind of in line with 2020 and 2021 were about the same. This year so far, we're seeing um, a, a just as fast of a rate uh, as 2021. So we're looking at probably if everything remains the same, uh, being around the same number that we had last year, if not a little bit more. So we're still a target, we're still getting hit. Oh, yeah. And uh, we shouldn't rest on our laurels assuming that it's going to change anytime soon. One of the things that we did notice is that uh, ransomware, a lot of it is now they break into a system and they try to take out the data. Um, so that they can do what they call multi extortion. What is okay, that? Yeah, okay. uh, somebody's uh, microphone is on. They might want to turn it off. Um, so uh, a lot of them will extract the data, and then they will, if they have customer data or resident information, they will then contact them and tell them, "Hey, this company 
uh, got breached, we have your information. You need to tell them to pay us the ransom, otherwise we're going to release your information. Um, so can you imagine that you're at a city council meeting and all of a sudden a bunch of residents come in saying, hey, I got a phone call from this guy saying you guys had a breach. And then if you guys don't pay them, they're going to release my information on the Internet. Um, you can imagine what that would be, right? Um, what we found with ransomware is most organizations, if they get hit once, they get hit again. Um, they try to target your backups so it make it difficult, if not impossible, for you to recover. Um, and they, cyber criminals are actually having what they call ransomware as a service. They will sell it to other hackers. Um, uh, so also, interesting little fact, since, you know, we all talk insurance a lot. Uh, a lot of them are attacking insurance companies who advise you not to pay. This is an interesting and new thing that started to happen. So hackers are now trying to attack the insurance companies, trying to not dissuade, have them dissuade you from paying. So uh, that's an interesting little thing that's going on. Um, this was just from January. Just in the first month of January, we had a whole bunch of uh, hits. Uh, just yesterday, a library, I think in Oregon, just got hit. So uh, we're still getting hit on a regular basis. We're also another type of thing is Chinese hackers are using ransomware as a decoy to do more cyber espionage. So in other words, the ransomware is to kind of just throw you off while they're trying to get all the information out of your system um, to use for whatever they use it for. So uh, our local government's a target. A lot of people ask that question. Yes, we still are. Um, we're, we're looking at, you know, you know, over 25% uh, in the different areas, whether it's critical infrastructure, education, or governments, right? So putting those all together, uh, we kind of take up a, a big chunk of that. Of course, in that 7% under education, there's also uh, a private education. Of course, under healthcare, there's uh, public and private healthcare. So unfortunately, when we look at like these reports here, it sometimes is a little difficult for us to tease out exactly what is government, but uh, uh, guaranteed we're about 25% there. So Ukraine got attacked and we, we, everybody else got attacked with them, right? So uh, we can actually see some reports here that kind of show you uh, when uh, attacks were happening. The blue line here is when Russia was attacking Ukraine. Uh, and then I believe the red line is what was happening uh, in Europe. So you can see that when Ukraine had an increase in cyber attacks, Europe also did. Um, the United States did not have as much early on, and, but now uh, Russia has said that we are a target for helping Ukraine. So we've now seen an uptick in that. In fact, the president came out with a cybersecurity alert saying that they understood and knew uh, that Russia was uh, launching cyber attacks against U.S. government. Uh, and when they say U.S. government, yes, they're attacking the FBI and all that, but they're also attacking us local government. So uh, we all get lumped in together with that one. Um, what else is out there? Deep fakes, <laughs> uh, disinformation, uh, fake accounts on social media. I just heard the other day that people who are setting up false identities to get hired to do jobs to go into that organization well, now that they have an account and then try to exfiltrate data out of there, grab customer information and take it out. So it's actually fake people signing up for remote work only type of jobs, getting logged in, taking the data out and then running away from it. Uh, and then you see goofy little things like this with uh, scams where somebody says, hey, I'm not really Vladimir Putin, someone kidnapped me and there's a double in my place and all this, anyways. Um, <laughs> I just saw on America's Got Talent, I, I don't know what season it was, um, they actually did a deep fake live uh, where somebody else was singing and they made it look like Simon Cowell was singing. Um, and although when I first saw it, I was like, that looked a little strange. But if I walked into a room and I didn't know that that was a deep fake, uh, some of it can be very good. And it's only getting better, right? So they can make it look like anybody's saying anything. And uh, it's getting... Uh, uh, better and better there. So this this is going to fuel disinformation, uh, and in a very contentious political climate like we have now, this is going to only fan the flames, uh, which is going to create other risks, right? So cybersecurity over here with this disinformation issue happening over there could actually end up with violence on the streets. Um, so 
uh, making sure that we deal with disinformation is going to be an important aspect going forward. Um, another thing, great news. Uh, <laughs> if you have cybersecurity incidents, uh, it may impact your uh, bond rating, which means that when you go to uh, get uh, uh, sell bonds, you know, for your debt, uh, it's going to cost you more. So it's like you have a credit card and the interest rate is going to go up. That's basically what we're saying when you, we say it's going to impact your bond rating. Uh, now, there are some things that can improve your bond rating. And one of the things that can improve your bond rating is if your uh, elected policy officials, such as city council, adopt a cybersecurity policy that can actually reduce your, uh, can better your bond rating and, and reduce the interest paid on the bonds. So uh, it saves you money. And over time, that can be quite a bit of money, right? Uh, and so you can look at Moody's, S&P and Finch's, they all have their ratings, right? Uh, cybersecurity is something that they now all review as a part of their process to figure out what their what your bond ratings are going to be. And over time, obviously, that's going to cost you more money. Uh, you know, a half a percentage point is, is a big deal. A quarter percentage point can be a big deal, depending upon how many millions of dollars it is that you're borrowing. And uh, you can look at some of these. I think this is... Uh, uh, Standard of Poor's kind of talked about how they come up with this criteria. And you see over here in the bottom blue box, it says operational management assessment, 10% of the score comes from that. Part of that is looking at how does management deal with cyber risk, right? And that's where that cybersecurity policy adopted by uh, council kind of fits in, right? So that's where it kind of fits. Um, and I think this is another rating agency and just the way they look at it, it kind of falls under the management. Uh, aspect uh, here as well, which is in pink, uh, to figure out what the final rating is. And then that will determine what your interest rates will be uh, on your bond. So uh, again, cybersecurity is now costing you on insurance and it may cost you on your debt, right? So we have to take that into consideration. The industry is screaming at us, this is important. You need to pay attention. And if you're not, it's going to cost you. That's what it's saying, right? And so even if you look at things like the global risk report for 2020 from the World Economic Forum, um, they're one of their top lists, they only have like four or five top risks that they're really talking about. Cybersecurity is in there, right? They're talking about, hey, these are top five things that are really important. Number, and, and one of them is cybersecurity. And they're saying, hey, this is super important. You need to really address it. Uh, governments, industry, everybody, we all got to work together too on it. Um, and there's a lot of statistics that they talk about in there talking about, hey, there is just like not enough cybersecurity professionals to fill all the gaps. Uh, they had in their report, uh, in uh, the global risk reports, they said 3 million in jobs. At the RSA conference this year, which just happened three weeks ago, uh, they said it's 5 million. So I don't know what the numbers are, but there's a lot of vacancies, right? I don't know if it's three or five, but either one of those sucks, right? So uh, there's things that we need to do. And they're looking at the increase in how much digital commerce and digital government is increasing as people become more and more digital citizens, right? So this is increasing greatly. Um, and a big, huge thing that they talk about is ransomware is increasing and 95% of security issues are traced somewhere to human error, right? So that's huge, right? So obviously the human error is going to be one of the biggest areas that we need to deal with. Gartner does some predictions saying, hey, going forward, what are we going to see? Uh, data privacy laws are going to cover most of the world's population, um, which for us doesn't really make a big difference. We already have California, which is one of the strictest ones that we, we fall under. Um, Cybersecurity can uh, reduce the cost of incidents by 90%. That's huge because remember, this is what the insurance folks and everybody's looking at. If you can reduce the cost of your incidents by 90%, uh, then you don't have to pay out as much in the insurance side of things. So the insurance is going to be very pushy in the coming future about you getting to the point where you have proper uh, IT security. And if you look at what the insurance industry has done at the RSA conference, uh, one of the uh, major uh, issuers on cybersecurity was there. And they said, we are looking at things like in, in regular uh, like auto insurance, they have a little device that you can stick into your car and it monitors the way you drive. And then they change their, you get a, they call it a discount if you drive, if you good driver discount, right? 
um, they're looking to do something similar to that for cybersecurity. And organizations, um, one of them that was at the uh, conference that actually uh, spoke on this is Arctic Wolf. They're a managed security provider, and they actually have the capability of reporting a scorecard to your insurance about what your cybersecurity posture is. Um, so <coughs> uh, figure that you're going to see that in the near future as an option for reducing your costs in cybersecurity if you have a good cybersecurity policy or procedures in place. But you're going to have to work on that, right? So you're going to have to have the actual good cybersecurity. Um, global trends, you know, looking all the way out to 2024, it's just, it's going to get, become more and more. There's billions of connected devices. There are more computers connected to the internet than there are people on the face of the planet. Now think about that for a second. There's more things connected to the internet and all of it needs to be secured than there are people in the world, right? And it's only going to grow. Um, so this is going to be a huge thing. And, and obviously all of that needs to be protected. And if it's not protected, those things can be used to attack us, right? So want to protect all that stuff. So uh, it's getting to the point where the Security and Exchange Commission is saying, okay, you now need to have cybersecurity uh, as a part of the board makeup, right? So th this kind of just came out um, because they want organizations, this is publicly traded, this doesn't have to do with governments, but wait, there's more, don't worry, I'm going to get to that. Effectively governing one of the most significant risks facing organizations. They say, hey, you, so what they're looking at is they say, if you're a board member on a publicly traded company, you need to understand basic financial information, right? You need to understand that in order to do your job. Now they're saying, along with that basic understanding, you need a basic understanding on cyber risks. And that's what they're gonna be pushing for. Um, and so they asked the question is why, why do so many people get it and so many don't? Uh, what, uh, why are we at the point where they have to force rules on us, right? So that's where we're kind of coming up. The same question is gonna be asked of the local governments and it's already been asked. It's just not as loudly as, you know, a federal government agency forcing something, right? But it's, it's happening. So the question is, and you saw the graph at the very beginning, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. Um, so the question is, how are you doing? And when I ask most people, is, you know, especially if I talk to an elected official, oh, we got it all under control. And, you know, I, <laughs> I don't share their optimistic appraisal of it, right? So the question is, where's that disconnect? Uh, and, and what are we going to do about that disconnect? Um, in fact, uh, uh, Marin County had such a big problem with almost all of the local governments getting hit with cyber attacks that they had to uh, convene a grand jury to go over it. Um, and they came out with a report and had recommendations about it. But one of the things that they're pointing to is the same thing that the SEEK is, uh, the Security and Exchange Commission, is that, hey, council needs to be aware of cybersecurity and they should have public discussions about it. One, to tell everybody else and raise you know, uh, residents information about that, but also to improve cybersecurity for the local government. So they're now saying, hey, it needs to be pushed up to that level. Now, I've said a lot about cybersecurity and you're like, it's all doom and gloom. Well, you know, hey, actually, uh, cybersecurity can make your organization awesome, right? It can make you more resilient. Um, it, there's a lot of benefits to it. It can save you money, lots of it too. If you Here's one of the things that's always frustrating, uh, has always been frustrating with it for, for me as a practitioner, is that no one asks about the security until after they've implemented something. And then they're like, hey, uh, you know, we put up this form online so that we could have residents, you know, fill out information about potholes. You know, it really helps us be more, uh, you know, uh, uh, responsive to them. But then they forget oh, we're collecting resident information. Now we have their personally identifiable information, including their email address and other information about them that is now need to be secured, right? And so you don't think about it. I mean, organizations don't always think about those things. Um, so it's a good idea. It's better and saves you more money if you bake security in from the beginning rather than at the end trying to um, bolted on after the fact. So if you want your, you can make your organization awesome 
and uh, help you with that. I think we have a question. Uh, Tony, is there a question? Uh, no, Don, that's just me posting information about your August panel seminar. Gotcha, yes. Um, just so everyone has that available if they're interested. Yes, so uh, thanks, Tony, for that one. So uh, Tony's posting a thing, uh, PRMA, uh, CSFMO, and MESAC. Uh, CSFMO, if you don't know what that is, is the finance officers group in California. MESAC is the uh, IT officers group in California. And PRMA, you hopefully know what that is. That's your uh, organization for uh, public risk management. Um, all of those are hosting, we're doing a co-host of this thing. We're going to talk about the insurance costs. We'll get more detail into it. And we'll also talk about uh, the costs as it's related to uh, insurance and uh, to bond rating. So uh, we got the three you know, parties involved to be there uh, to kind of uh, talk that over. So, and you're going to hear from the insurance agents, not me. And you're going to hear from the bond raters, not me. So you can pick their brains uh, as to what they're really looking for. The interesting thing is one of them had actually brought this up at the uh, RSA conference this year, and they said, uh, the insurance agent said, they call it the CISO rating, right? Uh, it's a discount. If you have a CISO in your organization, executive level person that handles cybersecurity, they'll give you a discount on insurance, right? So again, the SEEK is saying this, they're saying it, uh, ICMA is saying it, I'll get to that here in a moment. So the question is, um, and again, if you have questions, feel free to ask. I am going a little bit fast. I got a, a bunch of stuff that I want to cover, but I'm hoping that um, uh, you will have some questions too and we can uh, address those. Oops. Okay. So uh, board and council and management roles. So we've talked about this in the past and uh, you can go to my YouTube channel. I believe that I, we, we saved that Tony, I'm not sure. Um, the last one that I did, maybe not the six hour one, but we talked about governance in general for what is enterprise uh, information and technology governance, right? And it's not an IT issue. When I was an auditor, I'd go into an organization, I'd be, I'm here to talk about IT governance. He's, oh, IT's down the hall. No, no, no. IT governance is not about what IT does, it's what happens to IT, right? So there's a difference here, right? So what is management? How does management manage IT? Um, and, and so that's part of that. We talked about that in a previous session. This one, we're really gonna just talk about, okay, what's the board and council's role on this? Mostly, and then a little bit about what management's role is in response to uh, uh, the board or council, depending upon you know your agency. Um, I lost my place. Where to go? Man, I don't know why I did that. Okay. So uh, ICMA uh, did a local government cybersecurity survey back in 2020, um, and they've had a number of findings. And one of the findings is that top officials and organizations are often not engaged in cybersecurity at the highest levels. Um, it's they don't want to deal with it, right? It's an IT problem, just go let it, there's that idea or that thought in folks' heads, right? Um, so they found that top management is not sufficiently well-informed or committed to cybersecurity. I kind of think that the being well-informed, I mean, it's in the news all the time, but I, you know, how do you get them well-informed, right? They need to be a part of that. They need to get regular information, right? So that's part of what they were talking about. Um, uh, and the two other things that they found is that top officials, whether they're appointed or elected, are failing to insist on a cybersecurity or cyber safe culture within the organization, and they fail to act appropriately in their own cyber responsibilities. So in other words, uh, that's the good example of setting the tone at the top is if you are the city manager and you say, I don't wanna change my password, then you're sending the wrong message to the rest of the staff who does need to change your password, right? So those are the types of things that they found in uh, that survey. Um, now, and, and this isn't anything new, this goes back over 10 years, is that uh, even President Obama said that, hey, every level in the government needs to be involved in cybersecurity. And he said that 10 years ago, right? It hasn't changed, but we haven't changed with the times, right? 
we haven't caught up to where uh, we've been asked to. And that gets us back to that Marin uh, County uh, civil grand jury that was convened that says, hey, um, we need to get that to a higher level. Now, interestingly enough, out of all this, if you look at the ICMA uh, cybersecurity survey from 2020, they said 78.6% of the respondents that responded to this say that the mayor and elected officials and the executive team uh, attend cybersecurity uh, training annually. So the question is like they're getting training as end users, but they're not getting training on risk management, right? So that's where their disconnect is. It's like, how do they understand uh, the most important aspect, and if there's nothing else that you get from my talk today, I hope you get this one, that cyber risk is enterprise risk. At the end of the day, you can't fill potholes in the streets if you don't have cybersecurity. And I know everybody's going to say, well, I don't know about that. Look, if you don't have access to your financial system, if you don't have access to the phone or the internet, how are you going to order uh, the asphalt, right? How are you going to pay your employees? How are you going to find out where the potholes are, right? We become more and more reliant over time on IT information and technology. And during that period of time, we have not kept up with the risks related to it, right? IT is great, has a lot of innovation, innovation and invention that can actually help us become more uh, efficient and effective as a digital government. Um, but we that reliance has grown over time and we haven't kept up with the cyber risk. I think of it as if we're a bunch of lobsters in water, right? Someone dumped us in a pot and we're lobsters and we're just sitting there like, oh, this is kind of neat. And the next thing you know, gradually over time, the water gets hot until it's boiling and then we're dead, right? And the same things happen here. We're, we've been put in the pot. Technology has been increasing and increasing. You know, it isn't 20 years ago, it was a novel thing to send an email. Right, right. Not everybody's like, oh, I'm never going to use email. I'm just going to send a fax. That's so much easier. Right. I remember that 2000. That's the way people were talking. It's 2022 now and nobody almost uses faxes anymore. Very few people do. Everybody uses email. And if they don't have access to their email, they flip out because they can't work. Right. So um, this is the world that we're living in now. We didn't, we've gone from it being a novelty to being a necessity. Right, and we need to treat it as a necessity, and we can't treat it the way we have been treating it for the last 20 years. We have to understand that it impacts all government operations, right? Everybody, you can't order stuff, you can't order fuel, right? The way we order fuel, it goes, they have to go through the website, order fuel from them, and, and you know, select a delivery time, because that's how they do it. So if they don't have access to that, then they got to go find another internet connection, right? Or they have to find another computer that's not impacted by you know, ransomware or whatever happened. All aspects of the local government are affected and that we have to kind of look at it. And cybersecurity is much more broad than just even that. Like I was talking to you about disinformation and deep fakes and a lot of that's important for election security, right? So we've got a lot of other things going on, uh, not just talking about you know, your system being broken down. Um, so there is a need as we become, as, as everybody is really moving towards being digital citizens and we're working towards digital government, we need to make sure that we have that cyber resiliency uh, to maintain operations going forward. And that's really uh, council and the board or council or board uh, needs to understand it's their responsibility, right? It, ultimately, they're the ones elected. They're the ones supposed to be providing oversight. It's their responsibility. And I think that that's the message that we need to push forward. Uh, now, cybersecurity is a top risk. It's one of the largest risks. If you look at a local government, uh, you're more likely to get hit with a cyber attack than almost anything else um, that's actually going to have an impact on you. Um, you may have a larger impact with a police officer shooting if, if you have police force. Um, that may be a larger uh, cost, but the frequency is going to be less than a cyber attack, right? Uh, how many organizations, how many local government organizations could say that 75% of them are going to have one to over 10 uh, police shootings a year, right? So that in the, the, if you look at the statistics, you're much more likely to get hit with a cyber incident. And the cyber incidents, we've seen, you know, everything from a million 
to $20 million in costs for local governments to recover, right? So it's not, not cheap, right? Um, so we have to try and look at that. And all these organizations listed here, all of them are pushing saying, hey, this cybersecurity is top risk and they're not the only ones, I'm just put them out uh, because they're ones that we may be related to like American Water Works Association, AICPA, KLCPA, uh, Price of Waterhouse Coopers. Um, they're all saying, hey, this is a number one thing and even the California Society of CPA say one of the most important stakeholder responsibility, most important stakeholder responsible for managing cyber risk is the board of directors. Let me translate that to you into government talk. The most important stakeholders uh, to be responsible for cyber risk is the city council, or if you have a board, board, right? So this is one of the things that we're still needing to work on. And, uh, and say it again, cyber risk is not an IT issue, right? Think about all the services that your city delivers or your district delivers or your county, whatever it is. Cyber risk impacts all of those and on multiple levels, right? Sometimes it's more of the foundational support for that function. Sometimes it is that function itself, right? As we've gone more and more and rely more and more on technology, the more and more it becomes important. So ICMA, uh, again, going back to that survey in 2020, says that, uh, that it's critical for local governments to understand about cyber risk, especially the top elected and appointed officials. They need to understand the cyber, cyber threats that face the governments. And it's not just ransomware, it's disinformation, it's uh, election security. It, there's a lot of other things, critical infrastructure protection, all of those things. They need to understand what the actions that should be taken to protect those information assets. Uh, and they need to understand the gap between what we should be doing and what we currently are doing. And they need to understand what are the barriers, like what's preventing us from implementing the security. Uh, so once they understand that, that will, that will enable them to kind of see how critical it is for their government and how important it is, uh, especially as we move into the 20th century, right? Um, but they will then be able to support and make sure it's adequately funded and properly managed to cyber risk management, right? So that's what we're kind of talking about. So what did, what did they find in their survey as being some of the barriers to uh, cybersecurity? Uh, one of the biggest ones is inability to pay competitive salaries, especially here in California, especially in the Bay Area, especially with Silicon Valley. It is extremely hard to get qualified staff to want to be uh, working for a local government, getting paid considerably less than what they would get paid if they were working at uh, any of the big firms. Uh, so that inability to pay competitively is going to be a barrier, right? Uh, another thing is going to be insufficient staff. Uh, remember, I told you there's a lack of cybersecurity folks out there. How are we going to get that? Um, what about the lack of funding and lack of adequate training? Now, if you look at all of those, all of those are <laughs> around funding, right? Uh, yeah, so, you know, we're under investing in cybersecurity. And yes, we are, we have to, we have to still, you know, have money left over to fill potholes, right? So there has to be a balance. And the people that need to make that decision on the balancing are the ones that are not engaged. And we need them to be engaged so that they understand what the risk is, they understand what the potential losses are, so that they can then appropriately. Uh, apply the, the amount of funding necessary to fund all these barriers that we have. And it's an interesting thing because it's a it's as a cybersecurity person professional, it's not my job to tell you, hey, you can't do this or do that. My job is to tell you what the risk is, or my job is to tell executive management, this is what the risk is. They need to make the decisions at the end of the day. Now, there may be some that I just say, hey, this, this one's really, 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 really important. You need to understand how important this one. We have to do these things. Uh, but uh, for the most part, you know, my job is to advise them so they can make a, a risk informed decision. Right. And so how do we get to that point where we're giving them that information so they can actually make a decision that's based on risk and information? Uh, and that's what it's uh, coming up to. Um, one of the other things they said is that so I'm going to get this question, I know, because there's a couple small governments in here saying, hey, we're too small for this stuff. We don't need to do all this. Uh, actually, ICMI said, hey, if you're a small government, 
if worst case for you, and you still need to invest in cybersecurity, and you still need to have that expertise for management and the board or the council, even if you have to outsource it. If you can't insource it, like a lot, what, so what do a lot of little, little governments do about city attorney, right? They will outsource that function and they will hire, they'll retain somebody for a period of time. And then that person will be their city attorney. Larger organizations will hire a city attorney, right? Um, but so they're saying small organizations, you need to get that cybersecurity expertise and you need to bring it in, it, it, make sure that that's available for the decision makers so that they can understand it, right? So that's uh, what we're looking at. Uh, PwC, hey, yes, questions. Yeah, so uh, earlier, and I think it ties right in with where you're at now, uh, one of the participants asked, are you aware of any good self-assessment tools and forms of a questionnaire or survey that agencies might use? I threw some links up to the CISO website, uh, but I thought you might uh, know some things specifically to respond to that. This is always a good question to come up with. Um, so there's no standard that local governments required to follow. There is a standard that local government is recommended to follow, and that's the National Institute of Standards and Technology Cybersecurity Framework. All critical infrastructure is highly recommended to use it. If you want to get grant funding from the federal government, um, they will ask, they will ask you if you have it and you may not be available the funding may not be available to you if you don't have if you're not following the cybersecurity framework and other words, you have to actually fill out a questionnaire saying that you're following you know what level you're following uh, the cybersecurity framework so that's the biggest one to follow um, uh, if I have time at the end I, I think I have some slides in here somewhere that I can show you but basically it it, it, it focuses around, be your ability to um, understand what risks you have, your ability to detect an attack, your uh, ability to respond to it, and your ability to recover from it, right? And so they kind of have this like five little pie chart thing, and then they have a bunch of controls inside of there of things that you should be doing, right? Those are the ones you should want to follow. Now, people oftentimes will argue about that um, as to, well, don't do that one, do this one. And because um, uh, there's another one out there called the CIS top 20 controls. And, and the answers in the aim name, it's only the top 20. It's not all of them that you should be have in place to mitigate risk, right? So uh, the National Institute of Standards and Technology Cybersecurity Framework is the one that you want to kind of follow because it's the one it's designed for local governments. It doesn't, it's not super prescriptive telling you to do X, Y, and Z. It says you need to figure out a way, it, it, we call them control objectives. The control objective is you need to manage malware, right? You need to prevent malware. How you do it, it's up to you, right? So it's very flexible uh, in order for you to do it, but it's also a great benchmark for you to kind of use going forward. Excellent, thank you, Don. Everyone, I put a link up to the uh, NIST cybersecurity framework. So that's available for all of you uh, when you get a chance. Yeah, so take a look at that. And by the way, that's a good primer in what we use because we have we fill out the uh, national cybersecurity uh, survey every year um, that so that we are available for fed, uh, federal funding. And uh, that is what we just use to report to council, right? So we just did a report to council and we say, hey, here's, here's our baseline. Here's where they think we ought to be on the baseline. This is where we need uh, to work on. So uh, risk management capabilities. Um, so they want the board members and business leaders uh, to understand, and they want cybersecurity to be a part of that strategic planning and decision-making process. That means it needs to be a part of everything, right? It's gotta be baked in. It can't be bolted on after the fact. And you can see from what this says, this is not an IT issue. As soon as someone comes up with an idea, hey, I think it'd be a great idea if we tracked residents doing X, great. All right, let's start talking to IT and cybersecurity and asking them, here, what's the impact of this? Um, you know, How are we gonna store that data? Where is it gonna be stored? How do we make sure it's protected? What are our re compliance requirements for it, right? There's all these questions that need to be answered 
before you start making decisions and getting down the road. When you're halfway down the road and then you figure out you have to turn around, most people don't turn around and go back and do things the right way. They say, we spent too much money on this. Let's just keep on going this way. Let's just throw something on top of it and make it work. That's when it gets expensive. That becomes a waste of money. And it's almost always a waste of money. Uh, so some good things for uh, councils and boards. What, what, what should they do? Uh, how should they view cyber risk going forward? Uh, what roles uh, does the council play in all of this or the board? And sorry, I may just say just council going forward, and I apologize if you're a special district, you have a board, but um, it just makes it a little bit more efficient. When I say council, just think board, right? Um, so what role do they play in managing cyber risks? What expectations should they have or should they set for management? And then what questions should they be asking? If you think about that, think about that one for just a minute. Anytime you go to council to make a request for something, one of the things you have to do is say, hey, this is where the money's coming from for this. Because otherwise they're going to ask. They're going to be like, okay, you want to buy this new fire truck or tractor or whatever. And where's the money going to come from in the budget? And they may say, oh, it's coming from this fund. And like, okay, so that department now is, you know, spend all this money on this. Where, where are we not spending money now? Oh, well, we're not going to buy any police cars now because we need this backhoe. Oh, no. Then, then, you know, the board may say, oh, we really need the cop cars that are more important, right? So you, you have to tell them where the money's coming from. You got to tell them what the financial impact is, you know, what's being lost and what's being gained. They should be asking the same questions about cybersecurity. What's being lost and what's being gained? What is this new thing that we're doing and what is the impact uh, to the organization as far as risk is concerned, right? And instead of me saying cyber risk, it's just risk in general. What is the risk? But what is the risk of us asking, uh, you know, residents to fill out information about where potholes are? Well, there's a privacy issue there, right? Uh, so, and, and there's also a compliance issue there, right? And then now, now it's like how we protect this stuff, another issue, right? So very quickly it gets into a rabbit hole about all the different little things we need to address based upon all the risks that we have. So we wanna make sure that they're uh, fully engaged with it. Um, so um, one of the best places to go to is the National Association of Corporate Directors. And why are we using them? Well, because nobody's written an article uh, yet uh, for local governments. And so somebody sees this, they say, oh, they're talking about corporations. It doesn't apply to us. Okay, 98% of it applies to you, right? It is the same type of information that uh, judges use for federal sentencing guidelines, right? So uh, we should perk up and listen to it. Uh, I will translate it for you so that you understand, A, it does apply to local government. How does it apply to local governments? And it's about just the right people that are the decision makers that are available to be able to make the risk-based decision. At the end of the day, that's what it is. Uh, it is, it's that same decisions that they have to make when, you know, they're at council meetings and they have to look at all the military equipment that their police department has, right? Uh, to determine, do we really need this? Do we want the risk related to it? You know, all of those types of things. Uh, all of that was designed to get the councils and boards engaged, right? And same thing here. How do we get them engaged? First thing is that they have to understand it's not an IT problem, it's enterprise risk. I used to say business risk, but you know, then I say business risk and people are like, we're local governments, we don't have business. Well, you translate it, right? It's, it's operational risk. What's going to affect the organization at the end of the day? Uh, and you also have a maturity level that you may find in organizations where some uh, cities may view Technology is just support. They're just help desk. You know, I need a keyboard. Tell them to come up here and do that. Instead of using technology as being strategic and, uh, and being critical, the strategic part is like looking at the innovation and looking at how can we improve government? How do we move to a digital government? Because we have digital citizens now. So how do we move there? How do we meet them and meet their needs there? The critical part is like, well, how do we make sure that we're resilient? How do we make sure that we avoid those risks, right? Uh, and one thing that uh, a lot of people have a misunderstanding is cybersecurity is related to IT. And it, although it is, and IT is probably one of our chief stakeholders, it's cross-functional in nature. 
Uh, hopefully you've seen that as I've talked through some of the examples here. Day one, when they say, hey, we want to create a new system that is going to do X, they need to know what the risk is related to it. Even if it's something simple like uh, employee or uh, residents reporting potholes, right? That seems like it's very easy and benign, but now all of a sudden you're now collecting data and that data has certain requirements to it. And it affects our current website's uh, privacy disclosure because now we have to change it to say we're collecting this kind of information now for this reason, right? All of these other, which has more of a legal implication to it. But you think about it, if you're like a water or have a water district or you have a, a wastewater district like we do, uh, a breach in cybersecurity may actually result in sewage being put out into the environment, um, which can have an environmental impact, right? So I know that a lot of city councils right now, they're really uh, you know, big on environment and social governance because that's a new hot topic. Um, cybersecurity supports those things as well, right? Um, we actually had uh, a good example of a wastewater treatment plant where a, um, a disgruntled employee who was let go, no, not wasn't a disgruntled employee, it was a disgruntled applicant who did not get hired, thought he should have been hired, who then hacked into the system and released millions of gallons of raw sewage into the river. This is what could happen, right? That One, that's a big, huge environmental that pack, but think about that as an impact to your local elected officials, right? Uh, under their watch, this happened, right? Uh, so again, cybersecurity's cross-functional nature, it affects everything and it affects everywhere, right? So how do we maintain, how do we deal with that kind of risk? It's enterprise risk, it's not IT risk. Uh, and it's important, it's necessary for the digital age. Just going forward, because everything's digital, it just needs, security needs to be a part of it. We don't leave our doors unlocked at night, right? Um, so why do we leave our IT doors unlocked at night, right? So, so we wanna watch also for introduction of new risks. There's all kinds of new risks. The big one now is disinformation and Russia is using it rapidly uh, and using it uh, to cause issues and disruptions. The last time uh, they were invading Ukraine, they uh, and last time we had an election, they interfered with it by setting up fake social media accounts uh, to propagate disinformation. Right now, the U.S. is in a very critical place with uh, 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 recent rulings from the Supreme Court, and those rulings are causing a lot of dissension. And Russia definitely doesn't want our attention on Ukraine. So it doesn't take a genius to know that they're probably out there trying to just, uh, you know, send out disinformation uh, to stoke the fire, right? So that's a, another big part of that. One of the big reasons why local governments were asked to go to .gov addresses, so .gov, you know, like livermoreca.gov, instead of cityoflivermore.net. Why? Because we want the citizens to know this is a legitimate government website and the information is accurate. And in other words, we want them to be able to trust that the information that they get is coming from a trusted source, right? So we, so the whole reason for going to .gov is to make sure there's a trusted source. So the biggest thing about that, I mean, it's a cybersecurity thing, but it's really to combat uh, disinformation, right? So again, talking about cybersecurity and being that cross-functional nature, there's all these little things like this that keep on coming up that we're trying to uh, work out. And how do we help them balance between innovation and risk? Any, any new innovation that you do has risks, right? Uh, so how do we mitigate those? Um, and then uh, council understanding that, how do they set expectations for management on what enterprise risk and cyber risk management should be? How should it be established in that? Um, now there's a complex web of legal issues and regulatory and compliance and contractual risks that relate to cybersecurity that kind of all tie into this. Um, and generally city attorneys handle a lot of this, but a lot of it is also tied very closely um, to very technical requirements. Uh, like let's say you're gonna have a cloud service provider and they're gonna manage your ERP system. Well, like what are the things that should be in the contract and please excuse me, there's a train going through. I mean, not a train, it's uh, our air conditioning that's dying. 
Um, so I'll speak a little bit louder, but hopefully you can hear me. Um, and hopefully that's not too noisy. Um, I, so, I didn't even notice, Don. I think you're good. Oh, you did it? Oh, my God. I, I think this is like, I feel like Dr. Freeze or something. <laughs> I, I think it's uh, doing a good job of filtering outside sounds. Wow, the extra $2 I paid for this camera is paid off. Uh, anyways, it was supposed to be noise canceling. So I was like, oh, it's only $2 more for noise canceling. So that's good to know. Um, so, so a lot of it, you know, a lot of my day, not a lot of my day, but a chunk of my time is spent with the city attorney and his uh, staff, you know, going over, okay, uh, what is really needed to protect the city uh, on the cybersecurity side of things, right? What is needed? And there's a lot of things. Like if they have your data and they have a breach, do you want them to call you and tell you that they breached your information? I hope you say yes. Well, the question, if it's not in the contract, they're not required to. So how do you make sure it's in the contract, right? So we have to, and every issue is different. Like we have to look at the risk of everything that they do. You know, the, the library may have a new system and that new system may collect information about what people are looking up online. That's a big, huge privacy issue, right? If you're in the library and you're looking up uh, certain types of books, um, you may be concerned about your privacy being lost. But a lot of the software that actually handles all that searching through uh, your catalog of books and all that kind of stuff uh, actually uses Google uh, to help them uh, you know, maintain information and manage you know, how many people are looking at the website. But then Google also uses that information to send those individuals uh, targeted advertising. Um, now, so, so here's another thing, like not a huge risk, uh, you know, the potential for, you know, a city getting, you know, compromised is not big on that one. It's more of a loss of public trust, right? And, and that is like, why is the government spying on me? It's not even the government spying on me, it's Google spying on me and the government's helping them. Right, so there's a little bit of a reputational risk there, right? Um, so, part of that is looking at that. The other thing is uh, currently, uh, boards of directors and CEOs are being held responsible uh, for their lack of oversight uh, or, uh, under the negligence of fiduciary duty uh, in publicly traded companies. And again, it hasn't happened yet at a city, um, but it's one of those things. I remember there was one in Florida, uh, the IT manager was fired after they were breached. And, and it really hit in our industry, in the cybersecurity industry, it hit us hard because it was like, wait a second, uh, this person was never given the budget, <laughs> was never, you know, tried to give the information to management, management would not, you know, help and or provide the funding or necessarily for the stuff that IT had already told them they ought to do. And they ended up firing the IT person for it. And the city manager was not held responsible whatsoever. How is that? How is that, right? You were given the information. You said it's not important. You got hit and then you have a scapegoat and you fire that person. That's what we're trying to avoid, right? So uh, that's part of the things. The other thing that uh, uh, this guide uh, recommends is that councils or boards be uh, participate in cyber breach simulations or tabletop exercises so that they can understand what the impact would be and how the city would respond to that or the, the district would respond to that. Um, you want to be as transparent as possible uh, without revealing any sensitive information. And that, that's a hard line there. As a cybersecurity professional, I like to say, hey, that everything's sensitive information, let's not disclose anything. Great. But at the end of the day, we have a responsibility to the public and we have to be transparent. They have to know that we are protecting um, their assets. It's their taxpayer money that's paying for all of this. So we need to be transparent at some level with that. So we, you know, specifics on like how things are set up or how we find, you know, uh, uh, specific attacks and all that. Yeah, we don't reveal that information, but, you know, where we are overall, we should probably make that publicly available. So uh, some of that stuff is going to be a very uh, tight line to walk. And that's going to be a tough one uh, on the legal side of things is like, how do you not tell everybody that your antivirus is this and it does that? Because if you go that to that level of detail, the bad guys will use that information. 
against you. And by the way, the bad guys do use information that they hear at council meetings to launch attacks on cities. We've seen it time and time again. In fact, we had one city who um, they had a uh, they were they had a new person in finance who got just promoted and they announced it at the city council meeting. Two weeks later, that person got an email saying it was from the city manager. It started off saying, hey, congratulations on the promotion. You're going to do a great job. By the way, I'm in a meeting. Can't talk now. Please send me everybody's W-2s for last year. I need to go over it with council. And that person was like, oh, wow, well, this, this has got to be them because who else knew that I got the promotion? Well, it was publicly announced, right? And the person could be in China that heard the public announcement, not the China did it, um, could have heard it by watching it on YouTube because, you know, we put the council meetings up there and they're, you know, also streamed live, could have found that information, used that information to tailor the attack and actually led to the compromise of all the employees information. Um, so now the bad guys have it. So the city, again, was facing possible lawsuits from their bargaining units. Um, and in addition to that, they had to pay for credit monitoring for all their uh, staff for the next two years. Now, the question I had about that was, why two years? Their social security number is not going to change in two years. Their address may not change in two years. So the information that's most important that was on those W-2s may not change very much in the next two years. In fact, 10 years from now may be the same information. So they could still use that information 10 years from now you're only going to provide credit monitoring for two years. Equifax did the same thing. I think they got they had to do it for four years or something. I don't know. I'd have to check that one out. But again, they should have to do it for the rest of my life, as far as I'm concerned, because my social security number, I can't just go change it. If you tried that, social security says, why? Why do you need to change it? You say, I had a data breach. They say, no, you actually have to have a loss <laughs> because you were someone stole your identity before they will let you change your social security number. It's the, way, it's the way the world works, but bad guys could still use it and steal your identity in the future. So oversight. Um, we have to understand that as, as cyber threats grow, our responsibility and expectations grow, right? We need to address those things. Uh, just like financial literacy, council needs cyber literacy. They need to understand what it is. They don't have, look, finance, uh, you know, as far as finance, right? They have to have a certain level of literacy and finance, but why do we have an external auditor come and look at the books? We do that because council is not finance experts. They understand how to read uh, financial statements, but they don't know if they're doing everything right. So they have an external person or organization do an audit to then give them a level of assurance, right? That's what the whole point of having the financial audits about so that they can rest at night and know, hey, I don't have to be the expert. Experts looked at it and they tell me it's good, but I still need to kind of understand, you know, the basics, make sure I'm making good decisions so we don't end up in bankruptcy or whatever. The same thing happens in cybersecurity, right? So how do we make sure that they have that basic understanding? And if they need more assurance, we can provide that with external uh, auditors or assessments, right? So this is how we can do that. Uh, so almost every, according to them, and I, I kind of agree with it, every decision that's made, almost every decision that's made has cybersecurity as a part of the element. In one way or the other, whether it's supporting it or, or anything else, it's a part of it. So we need to make sure that they uh, understand and they continuously get new information because IT changes every day. And so whatever they learned yesterday is quickly going to be out of date. Uh, so how do we let them know? Like, you know, the big, huge things with deep fakes going on, you know, they're going to be in elections, you know, it's really easy for someone to go and take uh, a footage of somebody. Uh, they need a lot of footage of a person in order to make a really good, compelling deep fake, right? Um, so a good example of that is, uh, you know, everybody's city council is, you know, they, they take the video and then they post it on YouTube or whatever. There's a lot of video of them talking and moving and their mannerisms. The AI can use all of that. The more that has, the better it can make the deep fake look. And so you can end up having, uh, in an election cycle, somebody could, you know, really throw a wrench in somebody's, uh, you know, election. Um, so, 
it's really hard to recover from, even if <laughs> it's proven to be a deep fake. So you want to make sure you want to watch that. Uh, is there a question, Tony? Yeah, there is, Don. Uh, so Bob is uh, asking, going back to your earlier slide where you talked about the percentage that's spent on cybersecurity and hearing everything that we've heard so far, uh, has anyone developed a recommended percentage uh, or at least a, a, a minimum percentage of what an organization should, a percentage to be spent on cybersecurity? Yeah, so they, uh, I've heard a couple of industry folks actually make some comments on that. Um, I've seen anywhere from 20 to 30% of the IT budget, right? So not of the whole budget, but of the IT budget, 20 to 30%. One of the issues you end up with is what if you're underspending on IT, right? So then 20 and 30 percent, you're gonna, you're now underspending more. Um, the other thing is Gartner actually came up with and said you should not be really looking for a percentage, because if you look at all your peer organizations, which we love to do as local governments, we like to look at our peer. How much are they spending on it? We're going to spend the same amount. Uh, instead of looking at that, you really need to be able to look at: Am I mitigating risk to an appropriate level? Right? Am I spending enough to mitigate that risk? So that's where they want. And so in order to do that, I mean, it's really easy if council could say, are we spending 30% on cybersecurity? Great, then I know everything's good. No, that doesn't answer it because what if you're spending it poorly, right? So that's the real question. You know, there's, there's two different ways of solving some problems. Maybe there's five different ways. And one of them is more expensive, one is less expensive. Right, and so you may mitigate the risk to an acceptable level with a cheaper solution, right? So I, as a professional, I would say, eh, I would try to stay away from coming up with a number, but I know that 2% is way too low, <laughs> right? Oh, right? So um, especially if other people are saying 20 to 30%, uh, but if I felt like if I was at 15% and I felt like we were actually mitigating risk to an acceptable level, I'd say, okay, we must be in the ballpark. We've, 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 we're not quite as much as what they say, you know, some people say we should be, but we kind of are in the ballpark. We're not at the lower end, we're not at the higher end, and it looks like all of our risks are kind of being mitigated. So, and, and that becomes part of the issue is like, how do you report all that to council, right? Right. Uh, so that's going to be the interesting one going forward. Excellent. Uh, Thank you. And I'll just comment, there was a, a comment a few minutes ago, not a question, but when you were talking about uh, threat actors getting information from council meetings. Uh, Savita from Fairfield said that they've actually been successful with their city council, uh, that they no longer have to disclose uh, contract names or the software that they're using. And they work with the city attorney's office to uh, redact confidential information that might uh, put them at risk. So uh, there are folks uh, doing that out there. So that was, that, I just thought I'd share that since Sabita got that out in the chat. That's awesome. That's one of the things that we worked at here in uh, Livermore. There's a couple of, <clears throat> there's a provision in there that if it's going to increase the risk uh, to your organization, you don't have to disclose it publicly. And so um, I forget what exactly, the, I have it on a bunch of stuff. I don't know where, I don't have anything in front of me right now, but we actually have the wording that says, hey, this under, you know, government code X, da, da, da. this is exempt from public uh, disclosure. So we put that on stuff that we find that um, we had a contract that was in the contract was very specific about how they were going to provide cybersecurity for us. They gave away too much information. And so we redacted the entire contract. Um, and then we allowed um, council to review that offline. Sure. Um, uh, Savita's actually given us a site. Savita, do you know what uh, which uh, code that's in? Is that a government code section you posted? Yes. Okay. So yeah, everyone, uh, Savita has put out there the government code 6254.19 uh, yep. has that language. Uh, a couple of years ago, she actually shared that with us and we sent that out to all of our members and had a discussion around this. So it's great to see that coming back around. Yeah, and, and anything that's security related, we label it with that code and we tell, you don't disclose this information and all that stuff. Awesome. Um, 
So the last part on oversight, one of the thing, well, it's not the last thing, I think I'm another slide after this, but one of the things that was brought up in this um, report was that there's an inherent bias on the part of management to downplay the true state of risk with an organization. Um, they have a tendency when they want to talk to the board or the council to say everything's rosy and they're they got everything under control. Uh, and that is just a known bias. That's why we have oversight, right? It's the, you know, it's, I guess Ronald Reagan said it once, you know, trust but verify, right? And it's one of those type of things. That's a part of the oversight process is like, how do we do that? Um, and so just talking more about virtually all decisions, which I already kind of talked about, um, they recommend that actually the board members or council members spend time with security team outside the you know, council chambers or boardroom, right? In other words, uh, also then look at how uh, your uh, CISO integrates with the other departments. Are they there at the beginning of the projects being done? Um, are they uh, helping those uh, helping uh, the different departments or divisions when they're implementing something new to make sure that they're addressing those risks? Um, you know, at the end of the day, I'd much rather go to a meeting and learn something new and to say, you know, the risk is low rather than to, you know, at the end say, hey, the risk is high. You really can't do it the way you wanted to do it, right? Because that gets expensive. So it's much better to get the security input on the front side of things um, that they really want to uh, counsel to understand what is the role and mandate of a CISO. So what should they be doing? Uh, and they say that they should have uh, briefings at least quarterly as the situation warranted. Uh, I think uh, ICMA said at least annually. Um, so, you know, it's going to be up to each, you know, individual council as to how often they want to hear about those types of things. Um, if not just as an ongoing basis, like you have a dashboard that they can log into and see anytime that they want to. Um, and so if they don't have expertise within the organization, they should try to outsource it. But they need to have access to cybersecurity expertise. And this is one of the things that was really big in the ICMA survey was, even if you're a small government, you need to have that expertise. So go hire it, right? So if you have to have someone come in on a regular basis and tell you, hey, this is where everything is. The part that I find that's difficult with that is like, you know, public works is gonna be doing stuff all the time. And unless you're in the organization and unless you're with them when they're making decisions or coming up with new ideas, you're not gonna be able to address the security. I did, uh, prior to coming to the city of Livermore, I was a virtual CISO. So I worked for a couple uh, different uh, cities and I was basically their CISO, but I was a virtual one. So I would come in when they needed things. More of it was asking me for advice and not really being able to engage with uh, the C manager, the other departments, or, or even council. So it was really difficult to get into there. In some of the organizations where I was able to go to council and make presentations to council, it was more of a cybersecurity awareness type of thing. Not like, hey, this is where your risk is currently. This is where you need to make sure you're, you're, you're making sure that uh, IT or cybersecurity has funding for these types of uh, uh, things. So, uh, and the last thing is not all one not one size fits all and it won't apply everywhere uh, but there's some general principles that will and that is that council needs to be aware that there's cyber risk and needs to be engaged in it they need to make sure that management's involved in it and they may make sure that they have the expertise that they need uh, to uh, make those decisions so the next thing is like coming up with a framework right like what are those barriers to cybersecurity? are they in our organization how do we get past those uh, what legacy reporting structures do we have? What uh, legacy decision-making processes do we have? One of the biggest things that they've said is like, you know, the decision-makings and the way that organizations were designed uh, hierarchically within an organization back in 2000 don't apply anymore. We are now digital governments, whether we realize it or not. Um, and it's a digital age. And so much in every day, more and more stuff is becoming digital that it changes the way IT and cybersecurity need to interact within the organization. And so the idea of the siloed models that we have, that most cities have, uh, is actually hurting us, not helping us. And one of the reasons why we're a little bit behind the public sector, take that back, one of the reasons why we're really far behind the public sector is because we're still doing things like, we've always done it this way, so I keep on doing it that way. Uh, instead of working for, like, how do we get out of this? How do we 
how do we engage in this stuff? How do we make sure that innovation is, important, is, is part of our decision-making process, but also how do we make sure that we mitigate those risks? And the other thing that we're not really taking into consideration is everything is interdependent. Now, it, when I say IT is interdependent, sometimes people have to give examples. And I kind of give you an example. You can't even fill a pothole without you know, technology today. Um, but if you think about it, you can't do anything without finance today either, right? And it's always been that way. So if you didn't have money, you can't buy things. You can't buy things, you can't do things. You can't pay people, and you can't pay people that are not going to work. So you can't get anything done without money. And the same thing is with technology and information. You can't do anything without it, right? Even, even our police officers now, they have cameras on them. They have communication systems. Those communication systems, they don't have communication systems. It's very difficult for them to do their jobs, right? So um, we're relying more and more on that technology. And again, I, I feel like I'm saying that too many times. Don't want to say it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's an important message that cyber risk is enterprise risk and we have to deal with it. Uh, so part of it is, uh, you know, the council needs to figure out like what framework do they want to use and, and COVID is a good one. It's a control objectives for information technology. Um, it's, it's written by the IT Governance Institute. That's one that you can use. It's very mature uh, approach to uh, governance. Uh, it's not super prescriptive. But it kind of gives you an overall, like you, your contract process, what do you have in there to make sure that your contracts are going to mitigate cyber liabilities, right? So it'll ask you things like that, right? Which is not an IT thing, right? What I just said, it's not it's a contract thing, right? It's, it has to do with, you know, um, the department, the city attorney, uh, and making sure somebody's looking at that aspect of it. Um, but uh, this is another one where that NIST cybersecurity framework uh, really fits in really good for local governments, right? It, it, it's out there and it says, hey, uh, let's make sure that you are able to detect incidents, uh, respond to them, uh, recover from them, and bring operations back to normal, right? So those, those key elements that we know that we need to do are already in there. So it puts that in there, it gives us a framework. What it doesn't give us a framework is like how management's going to communicate to um, uh, how management's going to communicate to council on those risks. That's the part that's not in the cybersecurity framework. So where you can find that actually is either in the cyber oversight guide of 2020. Again, you just have to translate it, take out you know uh, the corporate talk and just put in the city talk um, and. Voila, there you go, it has it. But also ANSI and ISA uh, have an integrated approach to cyber risk management. Um, it's a little bit older, it's like uh, 10 years old or so. Um, and it was really written before there was a CISO role, right? So we're talking about CISO, they didn't really exist uh, as a CISO, they didn't really exist until like 2006, seven for time frame. And when they were writing this ANSI, uh, uh, guideline, it was actually, they were saying the CFO should probably deal with all the risk, right? Uh, and then they mentioned the CISO as a new role that, you know, is coming out. But there's all kinds of other things, you know, a lot of corporations have a chief risk officer. Some have a business information security officer, which is different than a, a chief information security officer, um, doing kind of the same functionalities, but different. So, Again, corporate world's got all kinds of crazy stuff going on because they got a lot of other things that they're looking at. But again, uh, one of the things that it makes very clear is the CIO should not be a part of it. Cyber risk is cross departmental. It should not go to the CIO and IT in their framework should not be a part of uh, IT. So cybersecurity should not be a part of IT. Um, and that one of the standards, there's others that all uh, support that as well and including the cyber risk oversight guide. Um, because we wanna make sure that all the stakeholders across the entire organization are involved and engaged and understand about their risks to cyber. Uh, and we wanna make sure that they're, they also want you to have the framework to make sure you have a risk assessment that's done that looks going forward. Like what is the cyber risk looking at? This is extremely difficult to do because uh, market forces kind of influence cyber criminals, right? And so, um, you're starting to see a little bit of a change, and I think it'll get uh, as uh, like Bitcoin and stuff is being stolen and all that kind of stuff. Uh, there's a, a 
the trust in cryptocurrencies is dropping. Uh, and so uh, it's getting harder for cyber criminals to take that money and turn it into cold hard cash that they can spend. So you're going to start to see th that change, but we don't still know what's going to happen with that. So that's going to be an interesting area to look at. Um, it, if cryptocurrency went away, ransomware may, may not be a viable option for people, right? Um, because then it's easy to trace them. So, but a cryptocurrency is probably not going to go away, mostly because those are other organizations and, and people are speculating uh, that it's going to grow, uh, want to get involved in it um, and will invest in it. So who knows how that's going to be? So again, risk assessment, especially when you're looking forward, is going to be somewhat speculative, uh, but you know, you can base it on uh, previous uh, events. Uh, your frameworks make sure that you include compliance requirements like how what, what do we have to be compliant with uh, credit card protection information uh CGIS if you have a uh, criminal justice information hipaa if you have health information um uh, critical infrastructure if you have that what are all those things that you're that fall under that category uh like in our city we have CGIS, pci critical infrastructure pii and hipaa we almost got it all right. So th those are all different standards, all different requirements that we need to meet. Um, so making sure that the board knows where we are on all of those things. Uh, and again, it's going to be a collaborative approach. So whatever framework you have, you have to make sure you work with all the other departments. And another thing that this uh, framework had recommended is that the budget is for cybersecurity be separate from IT. Now they didn't get into like what you include in cybersecurity versus IT. Like, does a firewall go in IT under infrastructure? Does it go in IT, or does it go under cybersecurity as uh, you know, perimeter defense? Uh, you know, there hasn't been a decision on that. So again, those numbers again about what percentage you should be spending is going to be a little bit convoluted. So, uh, monitoring reporting. Uh, uh, one of the things that's important for everyone to understand is that perfect cybersecurity is unrealistic. Just like any kind of security is unrealistic. It's not a, not a, oh, check a box, we're secure. Great, let's go. No, there's always continuing and evolving risk, right? And so managing that risk is always gonna be continuous, not a goal, it's gonna be ongoing. Um, but cybersecurity is growing and it's becoming strategic and it should be really be viewed as strategic at this point in time. And of course, we have limited funds and we need to balance that risk, right? We can't buy everything to secure everything. Um, I'm probably one of the few uh, cybersecurity people because a lot of cybersecurity people, we need to buy all these things. And I'm like, yeah, but OK, what's going to actually get us the best value for the, the limited funds we have, right? We can't just spend all of our money on it because then we can't fix potholes. We still, at the end of the day, need to fix potholes, but we need to do it at a lower risk level, right? Um, so that ability to understand the economics of cybersecurity is something that needs to be in management's uh, realm. Um, and this is going to be a hard one. Um, and even as a cybersecurity professional, we haven't figured it out ourselves. We need to report to uh, council in a way that uh, highlights monetary. You know, what's the monetary cost of a, of a ransomware incident, right? Um, uh, I was talking to Tony about this the other day, and I said, this is where, you know, insurance companies can really help us out. They have actuarial tables, and they can tell us what losses uh, organizations have uh, faced that have similar type of risk that we do. Uh, that's great, but like Tony pointed out very astutely, you know, this is a brand new market for them. They don't have hundreds of years of actuarial tables to go back to, you know, people tripping on the sidewalk. They got lots of years, multiple decades of that. They can, you know, Figure that out to the penny how much is it going to cost. Can't figure that out for cyber yet. It's too much all over the place. So that's a hard thing. So how do I communicate to council, hey, it's going to cost X amount if we have a ransomware thing? Because then they can pick it apart, right? They can say, well, you know, I heard it costs this much on average. And well, this other report says this much on average. So it, it becomes really difficult to do that. And, and the thing is, what is the impact to your organization if someone clicks on a link? It could be from zero, nothing happens, <laughs> to $20 million, right? So what do I do? Split the difference and say it's 10, right? So that doesn't make any sense. So getting that information where we can get it to the council in a, in a way that they can make decisions 
on how much should we spend on cybersecurity, they need to know how much it would cost if we don't, right? So that's gonna be the hard part. That's gonna be the tricky part. And even in this guide that they're talking about, they're like, yeah, this is gonna be a tough one, but we gotta get there. Um, it, the, the thing that most of us do is that we say it's low, moderate or high risk, but that doesn't tell council that they spent enough on it, right? So, cause they need to look at it from a dollars and cents per, uh, perspective. So that'll be an interesting one. So um, if you have inside, if you have in-house experts, consult them, right? And if you don't get the external ones, uh, and what you wanna focus in on, what you wanna kind of address is those probable and high expected losses. So ransomware is very probable, right? You have 2,300 local governments in the United States got hit last year, 25 the year before, 23 year before, 966 year is only going up, right? So what's the probability? It's highly probable. And what's our loss expectancy? Well, we've seen some of the bigger cities it's cost oh, you know, over $20 million. And that is not even just talking about losses in productivity or anything else. Like that's just the hard cost that they have. But think about all the other organizations that relied upon the local government that had losses related to it, right? That's not even calculated. This is a whole of ecosystem thing. You have a lot of businesses that need to get permits from the city in order to work. And, and you know, if you're down with ransomware, then they can't open on the weekend that they were planning on open because they couldn't get the permit, and whatever it is. Now they've had a loss. Right. So the industry as a whole has a lot of uncalculated losses that are related to third parties uh, that have been impacted by another organization's loss. Right. But think about this. Um, what was it? Uh, I think it was a local government was uh, needed, was running out of fuel for their fire trucks or something like that. And they went to order it from the organization that had it. Uh, and that organization was debilitated by a ransomware attack themselves. And so it costs a lot of time for the local government to go and find another place to get the fuel for their fire engines. So again, think about this because uh, your third parties that you rely on, if they have a cyber incident, it can impact you. And in a case when you're trying to fight a fire, especially some of the crazy fires that we have here in California, every minute counts, right? And if you don't push that fire back fast enough, it can get out of control, right? And so if you can't order fuel so your trucks can get to the right location because of a cyber attack that had nothing to do with you, um, like, what do you do, right? So uh, again, cybersecurity is becoming much, much, much more important. Uh, so we wanna make sure that we're resilient for that. So part of our job in being resilient from a cybersecurity standpoint is looking at a third party risk and what do those third parties have and how do we mitigate that? So what's important for us to do our job? getting fuel, if we don't have fuel, we just did this with our public works. Uh, we did it with uh, CISA, uh, Department of Homeland Security can do physical security reviews, but they also do like a business resiliency one. They ask you, okay, what does it take you to do your job? And one of the things we talked about was, well, we need fuel. Okay, uh, where did, where is your source? We have a single source. Oh, problem number one, you should have more than one source, right? Because what if that one source has an issue, right? How are you going to then fuel your fleet? So again, to be resilient is looking beyond just looking at um, other things, right? The cybersecurity is a part of it. Um, and the other things to, to the boards and management need to understand is economics are in favor of the attackers. The bad guys only have to get it right once. We have to get it right every time. The one time we don't get it right, they get it right, and then we're hit, right? So this is one of those types of things where it's just like, it, it's not stacked in our favor. So when we report things to management, whatever metrics we're gonna use, and this cyber uh, risk oversight has some tools in the appendixes, you can look it up and look at it. Some of it is very corporatist that, you know, would not apply to a city, but again, 90% of it does. But obviously when you report to uh, 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 council, it should be relevant, right? Uh, it should be reader friendly. Uh, it should not be written in technical terms. Uh, it should convey the meaning, you know, showing that you're addressing the cyber risks. And it should highlight any changes. So what's changed since the last time you reported to them? Uh, what is there any performance expectations that you are going to report? And it should be concise. And it should be able to give them the ability to discuss and have a dialogue about it, right? So that's a 
kind of a tall order, but that's kind of what they should be asking for. They should be asking for reporting on cybersecurity related to this. Um, the next thing is they need to own the problem, right? Um, executives, senior management and councils need to be able to own the problem. They need to understand um, that their role in this, how technology plays a part in their risk, which includes financial and technical risks, and how are they going to manage that? At the end of the day, how are they going to manage that, right? Um, and it's interesting because some of the earlier documents that were written about cyber risk managements, like this one here from ANSI, which I quoted earlier, is actually written for CFOs and it's saying, hey, CFOs, what do you need to understand about uh, cyber risk? And it's gotten to the point where CFOs are like, that's way too much for us. We can't, this is too much information. This needs to be another department. So since then, it's kind of shifted away from CFOs. Um, but it, wherever it is, when you're, again, whatever your organization does, you just need to make sure that the information gets to the right people to make the right decisions, right? Um, but again, the cyber risk doesn't belong to IT. It belongs to the council or board, right? And it's their responsibility to make sure management's engaged in dealing with it. Um, so that's their role for it. Now, and I did talk a little bit about uh, enterprise of governance and information technology um, and, and why that's important. So there's all frameworks out there that can kind of help you do all this. Part of what governance is about, we, we used to call it IT governance. We don't call it that anymore. We call it enterprise governance of information technology because we want to make sure that they understand that it's not an IT issue. So the whole industry changed what we call it for organizations to understand it's not an IT issue, right? So the whole idea about this EGIT that we call it is, does digital transformation bring value to the organization? And that includes all the innovation that IT is doing, whether it's AI, whether whatever it is, right? Um, whatever it is, is it bringing value to the organization? We don't just go and say, hey, we're gonna buy this new thing, it's got AI and we're gonna implement it. Okay, great, but what is it value is it bringing to the organization? I don't know, it's just really cool, it's got AI. No, no, no. If it doesn't bring value to the organization, we don't implement it, right? So governance makes sure that we're just not buying things just to buy things. There's a tendency uh, for departments and stuff like that to just say, hey, this is a cool new tool and I really like that. But does, do, can they really make a business case that they're better off with that tool? So they're going to spend a whole bunch of money, but how is it going to make them much more efficient? That's the question, right, at the end of the day. Um, so how do you put in a process in there to make sure that all this stuff gets evaluated and that, you know, the decision makers understand that. The other part of it is to mitigate business risk that results from that digital transformation. So that's where the cybersecurity part comes in, right? It's like, how do we make sure that we're addressing whatever those risks are? So the goal here is to ensure that policymakers have the cyber risk information they need to set policy. At the end of the day, that's what they need to do that we're mitigating enterprise risk, and that we're it's still enabling the enterprise to be resilient and be able to do you know, their job. So that disaster re resilience that we need to have, if something happens, can we still continue? State of California actually implemented as a new part of EOCs, ESF 18, if you haven't seen it, it's the cybersecurity function for EOCs. So now it's been added to the EOC. Again, this is another example of that where we need to make sure that we bake into all of our products, especially EOC products, that resiliency that's necessary. And if we're relying on um, digital systems, which we do rely on digital systems for EOC, how do we make sure that they're going to be available? They're going to be resilient, that they're not going to get hit with uh, ransomware attacks, right? All of those that we have it when we're needed. So those are some of the questions that we have, and then we have to look at those things as we go forward. So governance, you know, there's a, a, a slide that's usually used that we show governance that shows that, you know, the board or the council does the evaluation, directing and monitoring. That's that government process. And the management process is planning, building and running and monitoring uh, the processes within the organization, right? And so, you can look at things like this that kind of really show you, okay, here's where the board and council is, here's where all the department's divisions are, here's where executive management is, 
and, and you know where their roles kind of fit. And that CISO, which is that one that's kind of like the one-off, uh, is is that role that they want to make sure that they ask you have uh, that you have so there's somebody who can give the cybersecurity information to the right people, the decision made, the executive team, and the council board. Who's that person? And again, it could be an outsourced person, um, but can you get the information that they need so they can do um, their policy directives or whatever? When you look at enterprise risk management, especially the cyber side of it, it touches all these other areas. All these other areas are touched by it, right? And cyber governance becomes a part of all of these things. And yeah, cybersecurity, there's a part of cybersecurity that's not what I've just talked about today. The part of cybersecurity that is the operations aspect, the monitoring of the system on a continuous basis and responding to that. Uh, sometimes those functions are in IT. Um, and Gartner has those as two different types of cybersecurity, one that's in IT and one that's out. The one that's out is really dealing with all of the interactions between all of this. Uh, the interactions between emergency management uh, and that risk as it relates to cybersecurity compliance and how it relates to that and physical security and it relates to it. There is actually going on a convergence between physical and cybersecurity now because so much of the physical security now is relying on cybersecurity and it's just another system that cybersecurity now is monitoring. So physical security is kind of getting sucked into that industry-wide, worldwide, that's what's happening with it. Um, Cybersecurity may interact with internal audit or risk management or environmental governance, right? Making sure that we're not letting millions of gallons of waste go out into um, the uh, ocean or rivers or whatever it is. Uh, social governance, how do you make sure that you're one monitoring that? But then the second part is like, how do you make sure that um, they're, they're the messaging is getting across and that you know it's not being tampered with and that you have that trustworthy information coming from a .gov website, all those types of things kind of overlap in that. The legal aspect of it. Um, so many of the contracts we do, especially all those related to technology, all have an important part uh, for uh, cyber risk, right? Uh, in addition to that, which is another one that we're not really good at is like, uh, let's say you have a contract from a construction firm and they're going to come in and they're going to build a building for you. And you say, well, there's not a lot of cybersecurity there. What happens if they get hacked and then they're not able to perform, right? So because they don't have good cybersecurity. Remember I told you it was a whole of ecosystem, right? All of our vendors and every, everybody that relies upon the local government for services, they're a part of the ecosystem. So all of our residents, all of our businesses, all the small businesses, all of them rely upon us to provide them with services. So we need to be able to provide those services. Everyone that we rely upon to get stuff from in order for us to do that, whether it be concrete, asphalt, fuel, whatever, all of that stuff are utilities. We need to make sure that they're also secure because we can't do our jobs if we're not making sure that they're secure and they have the same cyber risks we do. And if they're not taking care of their cyber risk, do we really want to get into business with them? This is an interesting thing from uh, uh, an attorney that was at the um, RSA conference this last year and he brought it up and he said, we have stopped doing business with organizations that don't have uh, cybersecurity as a main part of their functions. If they don't have cybersecurity, we will deem them to be at a high risk of failure of performance. And so we don't want to engage with them, even if it has nothing to do with technology, even if they're just doing construction work. How do I know they're going to meet the deadlines if they get hit with ransomware? We look at the financial stability, or we should look at the financial stability for any third parties we rely upon, right? shouldn't we also look at that cybersecurity because that's a big part of their ability to perform. And if we're going to rely upon them, if we rely upon them and they don't have a good security posture or they don't have good financial controls, then maybe we need to have a backup if we have to use them, right? So we have a backup for them. Or we need to put something in the contract that they will indemnify us uh, via insurance if they have such an attack. So you can see now, as I've talked about, the cybersecurity is like getting into all these other little areas where we need to address that risk that exists on our vendors and the people that provide for us and the folks that rely upon us, right? So there, it's a whole of ecosystem. Obviously, continuity of, 
operations and emergency management also kind of fit in uh, with cybersecurity as well. Uh, there's close ties there. So like I said at the end, uh, it's a whole of ecosystem approach. Uh, it's not something that just applies to our organization exclusive of everybody else. Everybody else relies upon local governments and therefore we need to make sure that we are there for them. So uh, our cyber incident can impact others and their cyber incidents can impact us. And so we just need to make sure we understand that. Uh, the global risk report uh, also said governments at all levels facing mounting responsibilities and, may, and many are struggling to uphold their end of the digital social contract. Uh, yeah, we're in a bad spot. Uh, and it's seen worldwide on that one. It's just local governments, it's just the way we are. So what do we do with it? Our mayor actually had a really good statement when we did, uh, when we launched our uh, Livermore Cyber Safe. This is where Livermore does cyber safety information uh, to our residents and to our small businesses uh, because they're disproportionately impacted by cyber incidents. We wanna make sure we give them information. We can't force them to do anything, but we can make sure that we they have the information that they need, right? Because remember, us having an impact impacts them, but also them having an impact impacts us. So if you think about this, uh, small businesses, small businesses are, if they, they're, if they have a cyber incident, 25% of them go out of business. Local governments, if, if your tax base money coming in from sales from all those local businesses that you have, 25% of them are going out of business uh, because of uh, cyber incidents is well worth the investment to help those small businesses understand the cybersecurity that they need, right? Because that helps protect uh, our, you know, tax revenue. So when we look at those kind of things, it's a whole ecosystem. We're all interconnected. We all have to work on this together. We all have to become more cyber safe, all of us. And that's why our mayor said this is an important part of the core mission of the city government, which is to keep citizens safe. That is a part of it, right? People are getting, you know, losing their uh, uh, whatever's, you know, their identities and stuff like that. Can we help them? Yes, we can. It is very little investment for us to do that. So did we have a question, Tony? Uh, yeah, there was a, a question and then a little bit of commentary that came out. So Savita had asked whether anyone on, uh, on the training has developed a ransomware policy on how the city would act if there's a request for ransom. And and I know multiple, different cities approach this differently. Some have a, we will never pay a ransom type philosophy and others are more flexible on it. And then Robert uh, gave a link to a, a conversation on the MESAC website uh, that unfortunately you have to have a MESAC login to see. But for those of you out there who are IT professionals and are on the MESAC uh, site, you can see that. And then he also provided uh, some information uh, from CISA, uh, where I'd, I'd given some CISA information before too. And one of the things Robert mentioned was, uh, you know, working with uh, your carrier uh, to see what they'll cover. If if you are getting your cyber liability through CJPRMA's program, there is coverage for extortion, which would be a, a ransom payment. And there is coverage for the payments uh, it's up to 2.25 million uh, if you go through all of the policies that are available. And uh, if, if you ever do have a loss, one of the services you get with the loss is consultation with an attorney who's going to help you walk through some of the implications of paying a ransom because you also have to consider uh, whether the actor who's asking for the money is a foreign threat and subject to sanctions from the US government. You're not gonna want to pay on that. And in fact, I think the carrier is probably not gonna pay to a sanctioned entity. Uh, but uh, so there's just some conversation around that and whether anyone's developed policies on that. But there is coverage in our policy. If you have a loss, you'll have an attorney you can work with, but you also have what is your own appetite as an organization for, for paying on extortion uh, and cyber extortion like that. Yeah, Tony, I would add to that. It, I think that that's probably one of the most important conversations you have before you have an incident, right? <clears throat> the last thing you wanna do is be in the middle of a ransomware attack and then be trying to make the decision, are we gonna pay or are we not gonna pay? 
right? Oh, that's that is such a great point. And 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 it had and it really does simplify it. We've had members who've had losses who had had that conversation uh, in advance. And so they, and, and in one case I can recall, they just knew they weren't going to pay. And so that let them focus on what their responses to the incident would be. It was just one less thing to have to consider in the middle of the emergency. Yeah, and it's, it's a tough decision to have to make. And it's a decision that one I would, one I'm not making, right? It's councils, you know, really should be their responsibility to make that decision. And they need to be sufficiently informed and I can't advise them when I'm dealing with an incident, right? So, so that's part of the issue. But the other thing is, it, you, there's a lot of conversations like, like Tony brought up, you know, is it a sanctioned state? You know, you can't send money to terrorists in the United States. So, um, it, you know, that's just against the law. So uh, if it's a known terrorist group, you, you can't do it. So, uh, but, you know, there's other organizations where you don't know if it is or isn't, right? So do you really want to be a part of the problem? FBI says, look, we recommend you don't because if crime pays, crime won't go down, right? If you keep on paying the bad guys, they're going to keep on doing it. So, because uh, crime pays. So you have to make it not pay. So you have to not pay. Uh, one of the things that I thought of that reminded me when Tony said that was that a lot of ransomware folks are uh, organizations, the, the attackers, the bad guys, when they break into your system, they actually look for your insurance policy to find out what your coverage is. And they've actually had negotiations with uh, the ransomware uh, folks and the ransomware folks, uh, you know, the, the city came back and said, we can only afford to pay you a million dollars. And and then they sent them a copy of their uh, policy and said, we've already seen your policy. It pays up to this much money. That's why we're asking for that much money. <laughs> so um, bad guys are really smart. <laughs> so we're, we're not dealing with, you know, run of the mill folks. They are kind of uh, uh, geniuses uh, in their own uh, right. Um, which I wish they would just use towards good, not bad. Um, just think we could solve cancer if they just took all that brain power and instead of trying to destroy us. <laughs> uh, Over the last uh, several years, we've seen a reduction in the amount of money that the uh, on our program that the carrier is willing to pay on the extortion. So we've not seen any loss in coverage for the a breach response and, and responding to the incident, uh, but uh, they have reduced the amount uh, that's available. So uh, we have coverage across three different policies, a primary and two excess policies. Previously, we used to get up to 5 million, uh, which is the total value of our policies for extortion. And as I said, that's now been limited to uh, 2.25. It's actually 750,000. Uh, on each of the three policies. So it's something that uh, our carrier, who is one of the primary cyber carriers uh, in the world, uh, Beasley, uh, has had less taste for. It, they haven't eliminated it or excluded it, but they have definitely reduced coverage for extortion. Good to know. Um, I think I'm getting close to the end and I know we're running out of time here. Uh, there's a lot of different things in industry talking about, like I mentioned a couple of times, the chief information security officer. There's other ones and other organizations that are starting to implement these things. You're seeing at the state and county level, they already have these types of roles and you're seeing more and more local governments start to adopt these types of roles. Not that they would adopt all these roles, but sometimes that cybersecurity function gets stuck in like an organization, if they have a city auditor, there's a city in Southern California, they have a city auditor and cybersecurity is a part of that. Um, in another organization, they have a chief risk officer and uh, cybersecurity is a part of that, right? So each organization has to figure out how they're gonna do it themselves. Um, but the thing that you're gonna wanna look for is the, the insurance providers, the bond writers and all those other folks are gonna be looking for, okay, does the executive management have access to this information, whether it's internal or external, so if you're a small government, then go and get it externally. If you're a larger government, you have it internally, then use it um, and then bring that information to the board so the decisions are made. That's what they're going to be looking for. Um, so, and again, like uh, 
SANS here, I told you there's like two different types of cybersecurity, one that's kind of in IT and one that's out. Um, one of them, uh, so SANS kind of looks at it slightly differently. Um, and since they're a big uh, entity in the cybersecurity, I figured I'd put that in there too. They look at transformational cybersecurity executive versus an operational cybersecurity executive. Um, in most organizations, they try to put all of that on one person and that's a lot, but in most of us local governments, I don't think we're going to be able to do both of those things. The operational part is probably going to have to be in IT. The transformational part would be the other part. I don't know. Again, every organization is going to have to look at it. Um, there's a number of articles. If you go to ICMA talking about this, especially that cybersecurity survey 2020 uh, reiterates all the same stuff that we've talked about here today. Um, uh, they may have it in a slightly different wording and they don't have it all uh, gathered together in a nice format where it says, hey, you have to kind of pick it as you go through it. But anyways, uh, I wanted to open it up for questions and see if anybody had questions at this point in time. And while we're looking for questions, um, I always put this like you have to have a call to action at the end of any of the classes you ever do, right? So <laughs> you got to get started one way or the other, right? That's what Walt Disney said. And uh, look what Disney's doing today, right? Uh, you got to quit, quit talking about it and do something about it, right? And it sounds like Fairfield's doing a great job over there. Uh, kudos to you guys. Um, uh, we're, we're kind of being trendsetters here in the city of Livermore for our cities in this area. Um, so the rest of you, like, how can you guys get started? How do you start this process? Don't wait until you got everything figured out. I mean, you gotta have some guidance. So just start doing the little things and then work your way up. You know, have a goal to, to get to the framework and uh, all the reporting that's necessary, uh, uh, but do that. And so the question I always like to leave with people is what are you gonna do when you get back to the office? Well, you're already at the office, I get that. But what, what are you gonna do to change? What, what things are you gonna do to kind of help mitigate those cyber risks? What, what part can you do? And I understand many of you are probably risk managers. And the question is like, how do you partner with IT or cybersecurity to kind of help them with that? I work very closely with our risk managers. Um, they rely upon me to let them know what the risk is, the cyber risk is for something so that when they come up with the risk, uh, the insurance requirements for uh, contracts and all that stuff, that I've told them, hey, it's low, moderate, or high risk, and then they'll they'll know what to ask for as far as cyber insurance. So that you want to have those tight uh, bonds. City attorneys is risk management, EOC, IT, and then all the other departments. Uh, you have to work with all of those uh, in cybersecurity. We have any questions? I'm not seeing any in the chat. While people continue to think about it, I just want to remind everyone that Don will be doing a training uh, that the co-sponsored through MESAC, Parma, and CSMFO. Remind me, Don, is ICMA uh, co-sponsoring that as well? Uh, I've been trying to get a hold of somebody there to get them to do it. Um, <laughs> so it. if anybody well, has any contacts, let me know, because I would well, like we to- we know the know. three uh, big organizations. Uh, and I put a link uh, in the chat I think you'll find that very interesting because it has someone from the insurance industry talking about the challenges of coverage and someone from the bond industry to talk about the impacts of your cybersecurity program on your organization's ability to bond. And then I just wanna put a pitch out for our organization. Uh, we have a series of trainings we do throughout the year that we call our CJPRMA University and they start every year in July. and so. On July 21st, we'll be having our overview and introduction to CJPRMA. This sort of lays the groundwork for the rest of the trainings throughout the year. Uh, that announcement will be going out here in the next couple of days. It goes out to our uh, directors uh, who sit on, uh, on our board. So if, if it's something you're interested in, reach out to your representative with CJPRMA, which is probably your risk manager or someone who handles risk for your organization. Uh, if you wanna know more about uh, our organization and what we do for your agencies. Uh, Barbara has a question, Don. Do you have guidelines for the low, mid or high cyber risk classifications uh, that you talked about when you're advising your risk manager? Um, so I have a whole form <laughs> that I have them fill out. Um, so if a department says, hey, I'm going to get this new thing, uh, we typically ask them, okay, what kind of data is going to be stored in it? 
Uh, where's the data going to be stored? Is it going to be stored only in the continental United States? Is that in the contract? Um, do they have breach notification if they have any of those types of data? So there's a big long questionnaire that we have uh, that we use. Uh, and I can send it to Tony and Tony can send it to everybody else. Uh, but it's basically just a questionnaire that we go through and then I have to then calculate that risk, right? So what is going to be high if they answer no to, uh, they have no breach notification. If they are providing a low impact service on our organization, then it's probably going to be a low risk. But if it's like a 911 thing, it's obviously going to be a high risk, right? But then the other thing is the compliance risk. Like, is do they have personally identifiable information? Do they have HIPAA information? Do they have criminal justice information? That's going to be at a higher risk, inherent risk. And then if they don't have any controls, then it's going to stay at high, right? So we kind of have to, I have to manually calculate it every time. I'm trying to get like a calculator to figure all that out. But um, I have a GRC application that kind of does that. Um, but I don't know if the calculation is 100% tested. I got it there. So it'll tell me, it'll, it'll kind of tell me what its risk is. Sometimes I scratch my head. I'm like, I don't know if that's the right level of risk. So um, sometimes I just have to look at it, but I based on a questionnaire, get a bunch of information, know what the uh, general risks are of that type of data that we have and then what the impact is to our organization if there was a loss of confidentiality, integrity or availability of that data or that system. So when I get that from Don, I will, we'll, we'll get that sent out to everyone who participated today. We have another question, uh, uh, Don, uh, what GRC application are you using? Um, so I'm using six clicks. Um, they are a, uh, they're probably a little bit cheaper than most of the other ones. Um, they're a, kind of a newer company. Um, and the reason why I kind of picked them is they were cheaper. It fit within my budget at the time. And they have, they're very responsive to my requests of different changes. I'm having issues with the way that they handle risk assessments. They want you to do like a risk assessment. And I want to do just risks. Like I, I just had a contract. It came across my desk. I reviewed it. I know that there's a risk related. I just want to add it to my risk registry. I don't want to have to do a whole, you know, risk assessment to do that. So I have, I'm struggling with that part of it. So it, they may not be the best one in the world for that, but uh, OnSpring and Archer and others, all the big ones that are out there. If you just type in GRC, you'll find a bunch of them out there um, that are out there. I'm just telling you the one I have. Uh, Allgress is another one. Uh, it's local here in Northern California. Um, I think they're in Pleasanton, actually. It's where their headquarters are. It's called Allgress, all G R E S S. Um, and they have a system and a lot of them are really nice because they actually can give you all the charts for the cybersecurity framework, CGIS, HIPAA, PCI, all the compliance things you need to do. Uh, they have all that in there. So any others? I'm not seeing any more right now. Uh, we, we are past the time. So uh, thank you, Don, for one, thanks for the training, of course, but thank you for staying on a little bit extra here. Absolutely. And uh, my thanks to everyone who attended today. I hope you found it valuable. I always get uh, a lot out of Don's trainings uh, and, and today was no different. So great to see you, Don. Thank you for your help. And I'm gonna be stopping the recording right now. Thanks, Tony.